On that record, let's talk about you being an independent artist. How'd you even get a record deal to get started? Um, there was this movement for everyone to sign me. It, it was like uh, after the DJ Kicks and uh, the success of Sensuality and the underground success of Manhood. Uh, and I think people were starting to get wind of the stuff I was doing with Jazz and Nova. We were, we were like a movement at that time. Jazz and Nova, me, um, uh, uh, Bugs in the Attic, and a couple of other groups from over there, we were starting to really be noticed. Like, wow, what's going on? This new kind of interesting sound, this kind of jazz soul fusion. Um, so everyone was trying to run in to snatch us up. Jazz and Nova said, no, we want to stay independent totally because we fear the machine. You know, Germans are kind of very against being controlled by, by people culturally. After, you know, the Third Reich has affected them in a way that certain things aren't really cool. It's not cool to be rich or flashy. Yeah, it's not really, you know, it's changing now little by little, but at that, at that time it was, because they're from the east side of Germany where they're really accustomed to being low key. And I was like, look, sell it, sell it. <laughs> like, let's get this money. Yeah, like, blow up, let's do a world tour together, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And um, they were like, no, no, we don't do that. And uh, there was a couple other labels after me. And the one I chose sold me on the idea of being progressive in their marketing strategy and into developing. The head of the company was involved with um, Earth, Wind & Fire, Prince, and Seal. So he had developed some artists before but the way things worked out is is the industry shifted from investing into to abstract things and spending everything on short shots so to speak so i suffered in the sense that i didn't get support i couldn't go out and do like prince did when he started in tour for three four years before anybody understood his music they didn't give me that opportunity to develop that way so um, that was just a byproduct of a changing business creativity that i pulled out of being a producer in the sense of, um, let me write this melody for, for so-and-so or whatever. You know? e even the exchange with Clara Hill was more like she wanted a Victor Duplay track. And I happened to have one that I was building. And I said, well, try to sing on this. Yeah. And I w because she doesn't, because English isn't her first language, I, I wrote that whole song. So it was really a woman singing my song. It, it worked in that vein. Yeah. But, um, you know, that was a stretch for me to kind of go back into that world of producing people. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Victor Duplay. So going back to you as an artist, what was your mindset at when you created International Affairs? I was definitely at a point of a creative crossroads um, as a producer, as a writer. I was really bored with the way things were going. I was trying to push things forward, but being an artist was new to me at the same time. So I was somewhat still in a phase of trying to figure out what sound matched my voice, what style did I feel comfortable with performing. I had to go through that. I mean, that's, that was my first body of work in terms of an album that I had done. So um, it was adventurous in the sense of I was just, just trying anything. Well, I'll try that, and this feels good, let me do that. And I didn't have any limitations in my mind um, as to what things should sound like. I didn't have a vision, I just did it. And then there was always this idea the uh, electronic culture house broken beat the thing that i always said that has been missing in those genres is songs uh it's always performers somebody can really belt out you know put your hands in the air you know those basic chants and things like that but typically the songs are very for forgettable you know so i was really combining my songwriting ability with this futuristic style of making music. Uh, you know, it was the beginning of, of kind of merging techno, soul, uh, Afrobeat, um, indigenous sounds. That's with the, the real Bomba Plana players on Morena. And um, just kind of trying to make it all seem like it was natural. <laughs> Then, you know, we started to get these artists coming to the studio who didn't want to be original. They wanted to be like, oh, we want that music soul child track. And this is the one thing that I always felt cool about music, even to this day. 
his lyrical content is ghetto. Yeah, he has a version there. You know what I'm saying? Like that's a that's a perspective that wasn't in the coffee shop music that we were making. You know, yeah. it wasn't about the spiritual thing and you know I'm this holistic brother, she's uh -huh, this holistic like sister. Yeah. It's like okay, it was more like a realistic perspective of what's going on in Philly. The dudes are regular dudes. They look like freeway and <laughs> And uh, that that look, the big Muslim beards and what have you, and they like groovy joints, but they don't talk in that super one love spiritual peace peace. peace. Yeah. They don't talk like that, you know. It's more like you know whatever the flavor of conversation is, they're into that. Yeah. So when music was able to translate that uh, on top of the, that kind of groovy thing that we were really riding the wave with, and that's because Carvin and Ivan, the guys that created that music, or created music in a sense our basic guys you know what I'm saying and, and we have a discussion all the time they always say well how come we didn't really get a chance to really blow like Timberland and and Pharrell and all those dudes and I said because the city didn't match up to the sound like mm. Jay-Z and Biggie the images that they portrayed that was Philadelphia that's why they embraced Biggie so much because Philly was a Coogee sweater shirt. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Philadelphians wear pink gaiters and pink matching belts and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? They don't wear dashikis and head wraps. Yeah, basically. That's not the flavor of the town. Uh, whereas in Atlanta, they embrace a little bit more of a flexible image. So you can have somebody with a perm in a group and somebody with a dashiki in the group because Atlanta has that energy to back up both things and yeah. it's normal to them. For us, it was more like Oh, y'all y'all on that Archie thing, you know, y'all them Archie cats. You know what I mean? I, ain't, I, I feel it, you know what I'm saying? I'm with you. Yeah, but that's not my everyday. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you know, but yo, but but Jay-Z, son, yeah. DMX. That's that real talk right there. Yo, that's what I'm saying. Listen, yo. <laughs> it's like a natural progression that I think artists used to have, which was the label signs you expecting you not to do anything until your fourth album because they felt you need one album to get started and you need the next two to build your base and to really find the sweet spot in your artistry. And the fourth album is when all that comes together and, and that's when they expect the sales to turn around. So for me, I'm kind of taking that same approach in, in the design of this record and, and not just this record, but every, every song I'm creating now, I feel like I understand me better. I understand me more as a person. I understand what it's like to stand in front of a crowd and feel confident about singing one song because you know they love it and feel kind of lukewarm about it because it wasn't designed to really highlight your strengths as a vocalist or as a performer and create more music that you know I can get on stage and say look I don't care if you've heard this song or not I know that the way it's designed I can really deliver it for you to like it and and that's really the, the kinds of things I'm going to be doing with this record.